Welcome everyone to the International Forum on the Future of Constitutionalism, host for today's seminar. A seminar that will focus on one of the central questions of the present moment, democracy in our digital age. My name is Richard Albert. I'm the William Stamps Farish Professor in Law and Professor of Government here at the University of Texas at Austin and Director of the International Forum, whose mission is to marshal knowledge and experience to build a world of opportunity of liberty and dignity for all. I wanna take this occasion to acknowledge the life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who today is being laid to rest. She was a champion for equality, someone who fought with her mighty pen and intellect for so many of us to have the opportunities that we have today. I also wanna ask you all to stand in solidarity with those in the United States and around the world who are mobilizing for racial reconciliation a promise that today remains sadly unfulfilled. Today, we're gonna to explore the current state of democracy in our digital age. Subjects for discussion include the impact of social media in enhancing or deteriorating democracy, the proliferation of electronic surveillance and tracking, modern forms of information warfare, the democratization of journalism and new possibilities for digital constitutionalism. And to walk us through some of these subjects and more, I want to welcome three distinguished scholars. Jack Balkin is the Knight Professor of Constitutional Law and First Amendment at the Yale Law School, where he founded and still today directs the Information Society Project. He's the author of many path-breaking works, the most recent, The Cycles of Constitutional Time, published just earlier this month by Oxford University Press. Kate Klonick, Assistant Professor at St. John's University School of Law, her important work places her at the very center of our current thinking on the impact of network technologies on social norms, freedom of expression, and privately ordered forms of governance. And finally, Vivek Krishnamurthy, the Samuelson Glushko Professor of Law and Director of the Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic at the University of Ottawa, my hometown, by the way. While Vivek was at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard Law School, he co-authored an important study for the government of Canada on human rights and artificially intelligent systems. Our plan for today, each of these three speakers will give prepared remarks for around 15 minutes or so, with five minutes each for some follow-up comments. And the remaining time will be reserved for you for discussion and debate. When the time comes, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, just send me a private message in the chat function here on Zoom. And also tell me how you'd like to be introduced. I'm gonna to try to group the questions by theme and to sequence them in a way that I think is productive. And if in the course of our conversation, you wanna ask a question or make a comment that relates directly to what we're discussing at that time, but you are not on the queue or you're low on the queue, use the hand raising function on Zoom and I'll put you right to the top of the queue so that we can deepen our conversation on the subject of the moment. Well, without further ado, let me turn the floor to our first speaker, my friend, Jack Balkin. Thank you, Richard. Uh, today, we're gonna to talk about democracy in the digital age, and uh, I'm gonna sort of lay the groundwork by trying to explain what the new system is that we're living under. Uh, the system of free expression uh, we're living under is different from the system of free expression that we had in the 20th century, in which the major issue was whether or not nation states would regulate the speech of their citizens. So it was a, a, a dyadic system in which there was the nation state and then there were citizens who were regulated by, this, by the state and the question of free speech was basically how far they should go in regulation. The new system of free expression transcends the nation state. It's a pluralist system with lots of different players. And uh, for convenience, you can think of it as a big triangle. Uh, on the one hand, um, uh, nation states are still regulating citizens. They're still throwing them in jail. They're still fining them and imprisoning them for saying things they don't like. And that's the old school. That, that's what we had in the 20th century. But we now have a new school of speech regulation because uh, uh, digital speech, uh, speech now uh, requires or involves uh, the infrastructure of free expression, which is digital and is owned in private hands usually. And that consists of things like broadband companies and uh, the, uh, the domain name system 
uh, caching and defense companies, uh, so, uh, uh, um, search engines like Google, but especially social media companies, of which the largest is Facebook. And then there are other social media companies, for example, Google owns YouTube, there's also Twitter. Now, uh, this infrastructure of free expression, privately owned, is now another key player in the pluralist system of governance of free speech. And uh, so now, nation states realizing this, have decided to aim their attention, their regulatory attention, not at individual speakers, who are often too numerous to regulate, too difficult to find, often located overseas or anonymous, or are not even human at all, they're bots. And instead, they've, uh, they've directed their regulatory firepower at the infrastructure for expression, and especially at social media companies. And then the third uh, leg of this triangle, of, uh, of this uh, back and forth, is the relationship between the, the infrastructure of free expression, that is the broadband companies and uh, social media companies and search engines, and the people who use them, the end users. And this is a relationship of private governance. It's governance because these organizations, especially social media companies, create rules that they enforce. Um, through their terms of service, uh, through their content moderation systems. Uh, and essentially, they have limited things they can do uh, to end users, but they can do them uh, and use technology to do them. And they do them both through the use of humans and also through the use of artificial intelligence and algorithms. An important element in this new system, whereby states regulate both private citizens and the infrastructure of free expression, and the infrastructure of free expression, that is social media companies, regulate end users. In addition to all of that, which may be very confusing, but that's the new pluralist system we live in, there's a new element. And that element is that the lowering of cost of speech makes it possible for both states and private parties to flood the zone of the public sphere with propaganda. Propaganda is cheap and easy to produce. And what I mean by propaganda is something very special. By propaganda, I mean a particular kind of speech whose basic purpose is to undermine the possibility of a republic, that is, of a representative democracy. The goal of propaganda is not necessarily to say what's not true. Uh, propaganda can be true from a particular perspective, but its goal is to confuse people, to divide people, and to sow distrust uh, in the institutions of a representative democracy. It's designed to basically set people against each other and make it difficult for people to know what is actually true and what is actually false in a republic. And in that way, it corrodes the foundations of republican government and undermines democracy. So the best way to understand propaganda is not in terms of whether it is true or false, but whether it is successful in sowing confusion, division, and lack of trust in what is true and what is false. When people don't know what is true and what is false, they tend to simply believe people that are most like them. And therefore, this produces tribalism, and, uh, which is also very difficult uh, for a uh, republic. In any case, you can see that because we both have this problem of regulation and the problem of propaganda, the social media companies, which are the private infrastructure of free expression, are now playing and are going to play a crucial role in the survival of democracy. They are both the governors of people's speech and they police or they allow different forms of propaganda that are being produced both by nation states and by uh, private individuals. It's very important to understand that, that nation states both have policies with respect to the governance of speech within their own borders. And they have policies about the governance of speech outside in other countries. Just to take Russia as an example, Russia has a longstanding policy to try to affect uh, and um, uh, shape uh, the public sphere in other countries. So we now have a very powerful system of uh, media policy, both within a country and outside the country. Social media companies play a crucial role now in these strategies. The problem we face today is that social media companies don't really live up to the appropriate role they should play in a, a digital public sphere? Well, that leads to the question, what is the role they should play uh, in a digital public sphere? And so let me give you three basic ideas of what the role is they should play. First of all, social media should facilitate freedom of expression by lowering the costs of finding people and reaching them. 
Secondly, they should organize freedom of expression by uh, allowing people to connect to each other and through feed, various forms of feeds. And third, they should curate free expression and they do that through both through the organization of feeds and also through content moderation. And you can do these three tasks in a way that's responsible or you can do them in a way that's irresponsible. You can do them in a way that uh, promotes a democratic values and the health of republics, or you can do them in ways that undermine uh, democratic values and corrode the foundations of a republic. We can make an analogy, although it's not a perfect analogy, to another privately owned set of organizations in a democracy. That's the organizations that we collectively call the press. Now, in fact, social media are not the press. They play a different function than the press. But the one thing they have in common is that in order for them to play their effective role, they have to have a set of norms and standards that are, are public regarding. That is, they're focused on the protection of the public interest. Now, in um, journalism, especially in the 20th century, you had a set of professional norms that were designed to achieve these goals. And these uh, professional norms have been tattered and uh, they have been undermined uh, over the course of the past 50 years, but they are still recognizable and they still exist. The problem we face now is that these new players in the digital public sphere lack the same kind of professional and public spirited norms that would allow them to play their appropriate role. So that we can make the analogy that if that some people often say that the press was the fourth estate in a democracy, and if we think that electronic media is the fifth estate, well now social media companies are the sixth estate, maybe the seventh and eighth as well. They create lots of problems for democracy, and at the same time, they themselves are not democratically accountable. They don't have to be democratically accountable. That was never true of the press, but the press was governed by a set of professional public regarding norms. And so either you have to be able to develop those norms or you have to be accountable in some way. The basic problem is that there's a misalignment between the organization of social media companies today and search engines and their social function in a democratic public sphere. The reason why there's a misalignment is because of the business models of these companies. Uh, these companies are surveillance companies. In fact, you probably think that Facebook is a social media company. No, it's a surveillance company that does social media on the side. You might think that Google is a search engine company. No, Google is many companies. It's basically though a surveillance company that does a lot of different businesses in order to facilitate the collection of data and surveillance. And so the basic problem is because of the structure of these companies and their business models, they're basically surveillance companies, data collection uh, uh, companies. Uh, their incentives are misaligned with their proper social function uh, in the public, digital public sphere. And that should tell you why you wanna regulate these companies, what the goal of regulation is. The goal of regulation is not just simply to stop them doing things you don't like or to punish them for being large. The goal of regulation is to reorient their incentives so that they can either be democratically accountable or else they can have be trusted intermediate organizations with professional and public regarding norms. Because even if in fact you regulate them, they're still going to curate speech. They're still going to go govern large amounts of populations. So curation requires either accountability or professional norms or both. Well, what are the ways in which you might try to achieve these goals? Well, I'll give you a very short set of possibilities. There are more, we can talk about them more later, but uh, the key ones uh, have almost nothing to do with the question of content moderation. Rather, they are designed at basically changing the fundamental business models of these country, uh, companies, which are basically aimed at which is what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. So there are several different models. One model is to use competition law to separate out the functions of these companies, to separate out their data collection and advertising networks from the delivery and curation of social media services. Uh, also, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, break them up in different sizes. You can encourage through innovation, the creation of multiple social media companies, which basically have different affordances. Another thing you can do is you can encourage interoperability so that it's possible to create social media feeds, which uh, are necessary to counteract the network effects of large social media companies so that one can in fact join many of them and be a member of many of them. They'll all be on a much larger feed. 
But in order to create that possibility, you have to change the competition law, intellectual property law, and cyber law so that in fact, interoperability becomes possible. And when people create these feeds, they won't be breaking the law. The other idea, the other idea that I've uh, 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 promoted over the years is the idea of creating a concept of information privacy under which uh, companies that engage in surveillance capitalism, that is most digital companies that collect and monetize uh, personal data, become information fiduciaries. That is to say, they have fiduciary obligations toward the people whose data they collect and use. And therefore, they would have duties not only of confidentiality and care, that is data security, but also loyalty. That is, they would have to collect and use the data in the interests of their end users rather than against the interests of their end users. Right now, the basic business models of these companies give them every incentive to manipulate and in some cases addict their end users and not to consider their interests um, while representing all the time that they are in fact interested and care about their end users when in fact they don't really care all that much. At least the business models cause them to care not very much. So the point of a fiduciary model of privacy would to realign their interests with the interests of their end users. But you should understand in discussing all of these potential solutions in terms of regulation, that our goal is democracy. That is, we want a healthy and vibrant digital public sphere, and we want the kind of institutions that can contribute in a positive way to the promotion of that digital public sphere, because that digital public sphere is necessary for the survival of democracy. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, you gave us a lot to think about. And I understand from some comments I'm receiving that people are already beginning to formulate their questions. So thank you so very much. Let's now turn to Professor Kate Klonick. Thank you so much, Richard. And uh, you, everyone can now see why I went to Yale and started off as an intellectual property scholar and then ended up getting sucked in by Jack to becoming an internet law scholar. He has a way of distilling um, these things that make them so of the moment and really showing you um, and explaining to you how, um, how we should think about things um, and challenging our priors and preconceptions. Um, so I couldn't ask for a better person to follow um, because I, I have you know, most, a lot of what I've learned and based my own theories on comes from Jack and, and having conversations with him. Um, and so I just wanted to, uh, so I just wanted to kind of actually just pick up on the framework that Jack kind of uh, just kind of laid out. Um, but I wanted to kind of focus on two central concepts um, instead of kind of these overall arching problems and privacy and other types of things. I really do want to focus more on content moderation and speech because that is kind of where I have spent most of my time and most of my research. So the right now we have what has always been a public right, a public human right, um, the right of freedom of speech and the right of freedom of assembly as we're kind of seeing in this moment. Uh, and it's all, you know, and what's happening online, like now, as Jack has told me, or taught me, uh, all of the internet is speech because you need to use speech to communicate through the internet, which is why it's so difficult to regulate. Uh, there are um, a lot of things that that implies. And specifically, we have a number of platforms that have developed these robust systems in which we speak to ourselves and that we've started to live our entire lives uh, under these systems. Um, and, you know, there are systems that have their own uh, policies uh, around speech and what speech stays up and what speech comes down and whose cultural norms are enforced um, and whose are not. And there's not a lot of transparency on that. And there's not a lot of uh, accountability to end users. Um, but that is kind of even more difficult by the fact that there is not one nation state that can come in and answer this problem. These companies are transnational companies that are doing all of that governing of our speech, both within speech, the Vakes in Canada right now, right? Like we're like, I'm in, I'm in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, there, there, it's not clear what jurisdictional lines we, we would be, we would be kind of like, uh, encountering if we were to regulate speech across those across those things, although Equestic 
does answer some of it for us. Um, but the, uh, or doesn't, depending on what you think of that decision. But uh, in any event, um, I do think that, that, these are, that these are really hard problems because we've never had companies like this that are governing public rights in a transnational space that kind of exceeds the limits or the traditional understandings of jurisdiction and sovereign power. Uh, and so I think that that's just like one thing to kind of just put on the table is that that is a very hard problem to solve and that is a very new problem. Um, and, uh, you know, you could make arguments that there were corollaries that had similar amounts of power in like the Dutch East India Company or something like that. But I do think that this is, it is different in that like, this is controlling essential tools of democracy, speech, uh, and basic human rights, speech. And so it's a little bit different than um, like consumer goods, like, you know, that other transnational companies have sold before. Um, that being said, what we want to do going forward and how, what we're upset about with how speech is being policed on these platforms. How do we make it better? How do we ensure, as Jack just kind of laid out this framework of, of basically like we want platforms to facilitate free expression. We want them to organize our free expression and we want them to curate our free expression. Well, at least as much as facilitating expression, we have seen exactly how that goes. I think that is the, that is the techno-libertarian heyday, right? Of like, let's just like, let's just have more expression. Let's just all be speaking, right? Like, and this is, this will give us the Arab Spring. This will give us, you know, all of these kind of these great moments in democracy and freedom. We will be able to get out from under the thumbs of like authoritarian governments if we have more speech, all of these types of ideas. So I'm gonna, but like, I don't think that like, let's put that aside as a second, because I think actually facilitating speech should be set across from, should sit across the table from Jack's other two points, which are organizing it and curating it. Because you just don't, like the pure frictionless acceleration of speech that we have is like maybe why we're in this problem in the first place, right? But what the idea of organizing and curating speech is like slightly problematic because under what principles or values are you going to organize it? Under what principles or values are you going to curate it? And in those types of moments, we again run into this problem of transnational kind of cultural issues of like one set of cultures expecting and wanting something to be organized and curated according to their values, their community standards, their expectations for good speech or bad speech, um, high value speech or low value speech, political speech or non-political speech. And that is like, so the idea is like, seems clean. Like let's just organize the speech. Let's just curate the speech. But these are really hard problems that like, when you have these, uh, these non-balkanized, or these non-balkanized platforms, although they're increasingly maybe balkanized by groups and other types of things, um, that people can't select into rule sets and decide that they want this type of thing or that type of thing. It's just one big rule set that it, the entire world is kind of getting policed on. So I kind of want to change directions, which is how do you make that rule set better? Um, how do you get these giant tech companies to have a better set of rules that is potentially around, if there is such a thing, kind of global norms on freedom of expression? And I really do think that like maybe there isn't such a thing as global norms on freedom of expression. Maybe there's lot going to be lots of different rule sets that eventually kind of get broken out. But I think that if that happens, it should be a decision that end users have a say in, that global experts have a say in, and not a decision that is at, um, is basically just kind of foisted on us as the last kind of 15 years of online speech has, rules have been by like a few dudes in Silicon Valley. Um, so I think that the, and this is kind of gets into my work with the oversight board, which Jack and I talk about a lot. There are lots of problems with it. It is about to launch in the next couple of days, um, or I guess the next couple of weeks. And it will start hearing cases from user appeals and it will hear questions from Facebook itself, from people 
from policymakers at Facebook, which they will take something like a nudity policy and say to the oversight board, like, what do you think we should do with this? And the oversight board will write them a decision or make a policy recommendation if Facebook can listen to it or not, but it will all be like a public dialogue. So there will at least be some political pressure, some public pressure on, on Facebook to follow the directive of this board. This is not a perfect mechanism of accountability. I just kind of wanted, I want to point that out. The oversight board is a group of 20 and then soon to be 40 people that were selected with like, it was a very long consultation process, but they are like, they are largely people who are incredibly well qualified and have bona fides and like human rights, free expression, they're lawyers, they're journalists, they're academics, uh, but they're also kind of, uh, so I already think that makes them better than someone who just kind of fell like into the job of making global speech policy because they won the startup lottery. Um, so that being said, they're not accountable. We're not electing them. They're not accountable to us, right? Like as end users, they are not accountable even to Facebook necessarily. They are kind of just a global um, advisory body, right? So this is not like a way to make Facebook more accountable, really. It's like a very tiny toe in the door of kind of more visibility and transparency and a little bit more open dialogue and the idea that this is something that's happening and this is a area of power that Facebook controls, but it is not necessarily uh, more accountability. And so, but it, what it is a little bit of a moment for is the idea of kind of a culture of participatory democracy, a culture of like, this is a, this is a public set of rights that these private companies are dictating and there should be more participation from the people that those rights are being whose rights are being either taken away or whose rights are being amplified um, and so i think that that is kind of when we talk about the digital sphere sphere and democracy uh, i really do think that building there's like there are as jack said lots of calls to like get rid of section 230 let's make it easier to sue these companies that like that will fix things or let's break up the companies because the problem is is they're too big and they're surveillance machines and they're at like they're at the they're, everything they do is at the behest of like play, like selling their ads or whatever else all of these things might be true and content moderation might be a very small part, but it's a very important part. Um, and I do think that it overall makes their product what their product is and what keeps people in this ad selling regime and keeps their keeps the money flowing in and out if they can curate an environment that people wanna share their speech and talk and be, express themselves. So to that end i just kind of think that we're never necessarily going to get rid of these new types of technologies that make speech this fire hose so we're never going to get rid of these problems of like or having to organize and curate it but what we should change is who's doing that and that it's like we try to work towards democratizing and building participation from end users into these private systems it, like at, because I just don't think that we can fix them with public law. Um, so that is basically my my general thesis at the moment, um, and I'm eager to also hear what Vivek has to say. Thanks so very much, uh, Professor Klonik. Uh, you put a lot of stuff on the table for us to think about, and again, I know we're going to get a lot of questions because I'm starting to get them already. So let me remind you all to please send me your questions, just a word or two about the theme of the question so that I can group the questions by theme and sequence them in a way that I think is productive. So you can start doing that right now. And let me now turn the floor to Vivek Krishnamurthy, professor at the University of Ottawa. Please. Uh, thank you so much, Richard, for inviting me. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here today and to be sharing the bill with uh, Jack and Kate, whose work I admire enormously and has been an inspiration to me. Uh, today, as in the rest of my professional life, I stand on the shoulders of giants uh, in what I do. Um, in speaking today, I want to depart a little bit from what Jack and Kate have done in a couple of respects. One is to draw on my experience, not just as a scholar and student of these issues, but as a political participant in the two countries where I hold citizenship, Canada and the United States, 
and as someone who's interested in the politics of my ancestral home, India. And this is sort of in three parts. I want to remind us of what the, tech, the promise of technology was supposed to be for democracy before chronicling some aspects of our dark reality today and charting what I hope is a path to a better future. Okay, so the promise, the historical promise. If we think back to the 1990s, this halcyon moment, right? It was taken for granted that more and cheaper communications would lead to better things. More democracy, more international understanding, you name it. And I think the fall of the Soviet Union was very important in that, right? We saw the role of the Samizdat press, of the fax machine in disseminating information, true information that collapsed a regime that trafficked in disinformation for its survival, right? So we saw that. We had this belief that cyberspace was a separate sphere beyond sovereign control, as in John Perry Barlow's famous Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. And, you know, interestingly, one of the first things I ever published uh, is a piece for the Canadian General Election Study of 2000. Uh, which is an annual study, academic study of the Canadian election, along with my mentor, Stephen Clarkson, who's now uh, sadly departed. But at the time, it was fashionable to think that the move to internet-based political communication would foster transparency and actually counter some corrosive trends we saw in the 1990s towards the micro-targeting of direct mail or advertising in specialty magazines or cable TV channels. Like this was seen as a problem at the time. Uh, and the thought was that, boy, if parties had to communicate on the open web or via email, uh, the transparency that it would afford would mean that you couldn't say two, two different things to different, two different people. Uh, how wrong we were about that, it turns out in retrospect. Uh, and yet, you know, I do think some of the early promise was met, right? Cake mentioned the Arab Spring. We could also talk about the color revolutions at the earlier part of the last decade, where social media and other forms of internet, internet technologies were really important in fostering revolutionary political change, right? By organizing people, allowing them to communicate. Uh, the election of Obama, right? Where his tech advantage was seen as quite decisive in terms of voter mobilization, uh, political participation, outreach to minority communities, you name it, right? But I think there's two things going on. There's not only the technology, and I think Jack and Kate have both spoken eloquently about the problem of business models uh, of, of the social media companies and the ills that they've created. But there's also an overarching crisis of democracy. I think the Great Recession certainly uh, uh, catalyzed that, you know, the rise in inequality, the growth, which I think has fueled the rise in nationalism and populism around the world, right? So I think democracy was already in a hard place in much of the advanced world, uh, even if it were not for social media and the technological revolutions of recent years have made them worse, right? So that's a quick sketch of where we are now. So I want to, or bring us to where we are now. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about 2016 and what happened. I think we all know what happened. It's been studied in a great uh, deal of detail uh, uh, in terms of what went wrong. Uh, I wanna focus here on two other points, right? One is the impact of our new communications and technological regime on local politics in established democracies. And the other is in democracies that are, let's say, fragile or not fully consolidated. So local politics. I had an incredible personal and professional experience in being a political spouse in the 2018 congressional cycle in the United States. My wife ran for Congress. Uh, and it was the best of times and it was the worst of times as a technology scholar. On the positive side, I think my wife would not have been a viable candidate for public office were it not for technology. Uh, her ability to uh, start her campaign was facilitated by something called CrowdPack. Think of it as Kickstarter for campaigns, right? Allowed her to very quickly raise her seed money. Facebook groups were a major organizational part of our campaign. The ability to find your supporters online, to reach them, to organize with them, to collaborate, and you know the, the many other free tools that are available uh, to all of us uh, to, again, organize, communicate, disseminate information. And I don't think in a different era, it would have been possible for her campaign to go from a one person operation to having 900 people involved in about three months, right? So there's tremendous power in terms of organizing people and facilitating those high value communications that we want. But my wife had the misfortune 
of running in what we now call a news desert. A news desert is the term that a number of scholars have applied to uh, geographies in the United States and elsewhere, where the local media has been decimated for various reasons. One of them, of course, is that uh, internet, the internet companies ate the advertising lunch of uh, conventional media. So in the district where my wife ran, there's no daily newspaper, there's no television newsroom at all. It's between three major media markets. Uh, so in this news desert, the only source of political information was social media, right? That's the only place you can go to talk about politics and to get information. Now, I think there have been a lot of great studies post-2016 of uh, you know, and Yochai Binkler's study with Hal Roberts and Rob Ferris of network disinformation is very important in showing how social media uh, amplifies what's going on elsewhere in our information ecology, right? And I think they're very persuasive in showing how the right wing ecosystem of news uh, was very strongly amplified uh, by different social media platforms. The problem in news deserts is a little bit different, right? Because there is no other information ecology out there to amplify, right? Social media is it. Now, in these kinds of environments, the return on investment if you are a disinformation actor is enormous. A very small advertising expenditure, or just being the person who happens to control the Facebook group that has 900 people involved in it, gives you outsized power to influence a local race. And for all the attention that platforms are placing on trying to root out misinformation, disinformation, inauthentic content, when it comes to national scale politics, they're simply not capable of doing that uh, or, or haven't turned their attention at the smaller scale. And for those of you who follow me on Twitter, you will have seen that I posted something a few days ago where a friend who's running for city council in California um, was uh, basically the victim of a small scale smear campaign on Facebook uh, by an account that is clearly inauthentic, violates a host of Facebook's rules, and yet they won't act upon it, right? Um, so again, in those smaller races, uh, I, think, I don't think we've really uh, paid much attention to it. And that's really important because democratic governance doesn't only happen at the national level. In some ways, the governments that are closest to the people are the ones that have the most impact on people's day-to-day -day lives. So that's something that we're not really grappling with. But then there's the issue of fragile democracies. And democracy, I think, you know, uh, has been shown by a number of scholars to be in decline in consolidated uh, systems. Uh, and it is very much in decline in the weaker democracies. So India, I think, is an incredibly important and troubling case of the use of uh, the affordances of social media, not just by political actors, but by governments with the power of the state using uh, these technological affordances to enhance their own power, to stifle dissent, uh, and to pursue uh, agenda that I think are anti-democratic at their core. Not to mention the problems that we've seen in India, Myanmar, and other uh, developing countries, which may be democratic or not, with viral disinformation, not just on the, on the ad-supported platforms that, that uh, you know, engage in micro-targeting, but on something like WhatsApp, right? And I think WhatsApp is a really interesting and troubling technology in that it actually hasn't been effectively monetized by Facebook. It doesn't serve you ads. It's not used right now to target anyone, although I'm sure they're trying to figure out what to do with the data. WhatsApp is just a, you know, a, play, a pure encrypted communications tool that has a lot of users. And its design functionality in the information environment of a country like India has been able to spew disinformation with deadly results, right? And we've now seen what's happened in Myanmar. We're seeing what has recently happened in Ethiopia with ethnic violence that has been fueled by these tools. This is a very bleak picture that I painted. Uh, I'm the father of three young boys. I can't stand to uh, live in a world that is quite so dark. So I have to be an optimist and I have to find a way uh, to the light. So my way to the light is illuminated not just by Kate and by Jack, uh, but by two scholars who just happen to be Canadian who are influential in the way I think about the world. One is Margaret McMillan, who is a noted uh, Canadian historian of the First World War and the interwar period who is fond of saying that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. 
And Jack's recent book, which I haven't read, but his 2019 paper on our recent unpleasantness, I think is very important in thinking about the cycles of constitutional history and of history in a democracy, right? And that our recent unpleasantness in the United States is the, the product of an alignment of these historical cycles. Um, I believe that things will get better because the cycles will come to pass. We will come out of our current eclipse. Uh, but that does point to the need not just to reform and govern technology, but to reform democracy too. And I do think that throughout the democratic world, our institutions are in need of renewal. Uh, we can discuss the problems with the Senate and the Electoral College in the United States of a first past the post system in Canada where 39% of the vote gets you a four year dictatorship. There are a lot of structural problems in democracy that I think have come to fruition in recent years that have created a larger crisis uh, of democracy that uh, digital technology and digital communications technologies are amplifying. And it's striking to me, Jack mentioned the problem of propaganda flooding the zone. Uh, which I think is a real problem. But I think it's much worse in countries where social cohesion and trust and inequality are high versus low. So uh, I, I look at the Canadian versus the American response to COVID. Uh, there is an order of magnitude, less misinformation, distrust, disbelief, anti-vax or anti-mask sentiment in this country than in the United States, right? Uh, so you know, is that that our institutions are better, perhaps, maybe they're a bit more reflective, the rot is not quite as pervasive here, but we do need to tend to the garden. The next uh, Canadian scholar who I want to bring into this uh, is Marshall McLuhan, right, and his much misunderstood phrase that the medium is, is the message. Now, the medium is not the message itself. The idea is that different communications media uh, bias different forms of communication and make it easier to, to convey certain kinds of ideas. And McLuhan especially talked about the emotional content of communication. What is the register? Print being cold and television being hot and social media being boiling uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, the way we communicate on these platforms and their design in part, uh, preys very uh, on certain aspects of our psychology. Right, that makes it quite easy to uh, uh, communicate content with high emotional resonance that can lead to all kinds of problems. So again, I think we are very rightly having a conversation about the business models of tech, how they should be regulated, what accountability looks like, uh, how companies that are private corporations should be serving uh, a digital public sphere and democracies around the world. So that is uh, very important. Uh, but I want to go back to Kate's point about the fire hose of digital communications, right? And then going back to the WhatsApp example, we're going to be dealing with the digital fire hose regardless of what we decide to do with Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, right? Uh, so this brings me to an aphorism that is uh, much favored by tech support people in the computer industry, a picnic, a uh, problem in chair, not in computer. Um, so. Not only do we need to reform our democratic institutions, think about the role of uh, technology companies, but we also need to think about our role as democratic citizens and what it means to be a citizen of a self-governing democratic society. So media literacy may be a part of this, but we also need to, I think, renew our commitments to uh, a shared social project, right? We need to agree on what it is that we are pursuing in a democratic system of government. And for this, I think we do need to have some shared epistemological commitments. If we can't agree on what's fact and what is not, we can disagree as to what the solutions are to our problems. But uh, if we can't come up with that common currency on which to found democratic conversation, I think we are in deep trouble. And I think, so we need to think about the technology, but we also need to look in the mirror and think about us and our institutions. Thanks. Thank you so very much, uh, Vivek. Let me ask the three panelists to stay unmuted so that we can begin a conversation. And I'm going to invite the three uh, panelists to comment on each other's uh, presentations. And perhaps I can put a few questions on the table uh, as well. So let me unmute uh, Jack Balkin. I think uh, Vivek, I believe you're unmuted. And is Clay Kate Klonick, are you unmuted yep. as well? Yes, okay, great. So Jack, a question to put on the table 
for you, you mentioned uh, one proposal um, of treating these uh, entities as information fiduciaries, which would have uh, really the duty of care, as you say, the duty of loyalty. My question is whether, uh, rather than whether, what are the biggest barriers to this proposal? And I wonder where capitalism itself stacks up against other kinds of barriers. Um, and then Kate, global norms of freedom of expression, I think it's possible. I think maybe there are families of jurisdictions where there are shared norms, but there is a, a deep and profound cultural specificity to rights, even the right to the freedom of expression. So I wonder how one would arrive at a global understanding of what the freedom of expression, even in the narrow, it's not really narrow, but the narrow context of technological communications, even how that might be achieved. And then Vivek, if I could ask a question uh, to you, I have many questions, I'm just pulling one or two out here and there. Uh, on your personal experience in politics uh, with your, your spouse, you mentioned the challenge of local media uh, having been drowned out, uh, really bought out really of the system. Are you then proposing subsidizing traditional media through public funding? And so please, I invite the panelists to comment on each other's uh, remarks, and then we'll go to the room for their own questions and comments. Please, Jack Balk. Oh, well, I, in, in answer to your question, there are political barriers to almost any reform. Mm -hmm. um, so that would, that would be a barrier. The other issue would be how you're going to enforce whether you're going to use an administrative agency or whether you're going to use uh, a lawsuit. There's a third issue, which is how are you going to get ac access to the uh, the structure of the algorithms that are used for uh, uh, producing the feeds and curation. Uh, but there are various ways to do it. I mean, another thing I didn't talk about, but um, uh, uh, that would, uh, so if we think about Europe, Europe already has a framework for uh, privacy enforcement. Uh, they have GDPR, they can build on GDPR. GDPR doesn't have a fiduciary model. It has a different model, uh, but it, are, it has um, lots of different enforcement mechanisms. Uh, that can be used. And there's currently litigation in the European Union over whether or not the entire business model that Facebook is engaged in is actually consistent with uh, the requirements of the GDPR. It'll be very interesting to see how that litigation proceeds. In the United States, there are many things we can do. As you know, we don't have comprehensive privacy legislation <coughs> in the United States right now. And so one of the first things we'd have to do is actually consider passing such comprehensive privacy legislation. Uh, there are other possible challenges that could come, and someone might attack it under the First Amendment. But of course, one of the reasons for the fiduciary model is to avoid some of those First Amendment challenges. Also, there's another idea, which I was going to get to, is simply this. Uh, intermediary immunity is not required by the First Amendment. Section 230, uh, some parts of Section 230 are required, I believe, but most of it isn't. It gives much greater immunity than the First Amendment requires. So one way of understanding what intermediary immunity is, is a huge regulatory subsidy. And what one could do is one could condition that regulatory subsidy on uh, digital companies adopting public interest obligations. And not just with respect to privacy, but there are a number of other public interest obligations you could imagine being required. For example, labor obligations uh, with respect to the huge armies of moderators who are put in terrible conditions in some uh, cases, uh, requirements of interoperability uh, uh, with respect to competition law, uh, and also uh, the obligation to be a fiduciary with respect to each and every end user, and indeed everyone that you collect data from. Facebook collects lots of data from folks who are not end users of Facebook. I don't have a Facebook account, but I am very sure that Facebook has a digital dossier on me largely because I'm similar to other people who are Facebook users, but also because I visit lots of websites and Facebook has trackers there. So uh, you can use, you can leverage the regulatory subsidy, which is the intermediary immunity subsidy in order to require public interest obligations. This isn't exactly the same that we did in the 20th century with conditioning public interest obligations on access to spectrum, but the basic principle is the same. And it, it is probably something we should consider in the United States. 
Uh, Kate, Vivek, would you like to comment on each other's opening remarks, uh, answer some questions, please? Yeah, I have two, I have two remarks. One is on Jack, what Jack just said, which is, I, I love what Jack just proposed. I think that that is actually the best way to, and I, as Jack knows, as we worked on it together, uh, or well, I've, it's his idea, but we've been in seminars trying to build it into an actual real political thing and get over some of those political hurdles uh, for the idea of information fiduciaries. I think that ultimately creating some type of structure in which you um, kind of carrot stick with like these companies is the best way to encourage them to start having gov like self-governance regimes that are in keeping with the standards we want them to have, whether that's on labor, whether that's an info fiduciaries, or whether that's on content moderation and speech. Um, to just really quickly, Vivek, to your point, it was like I was thinking as you were talking and giving the example very specifically of your wife using CrowdPack to like to raise money. People, when, you know, when, uh, I think, was it a year ago, where like, you're people were calling for Mark Zuckerberg and for Facebook to really police political ads and saying, let's like, get rid of all your political ads, just shut them down, just take them like, and Twitter did this, which was kind of a stunt because Twitter doesn't get that much money from political ads. Most of like, you know, most political ads are actually run through Facebook, but, but Facebook um, didn't do that. And one of the things that I think was really important that kind of got lost in conversation was exactly kind of the point that you just make, which is that actually facebook has been an incredible leveling like leveling force for for grassroots individuals to launch campaigns and to cheaply raise money to be able to raise lots of money and cheaply advertise um to why to like to perfect target audiences and to not waste tons of money on like television ads or like something else um but that like everything else cuts both ways. I think you'll have just seen that they, like, there is a woman and I think it's South Carolina, maybe it was Georgia, like just one, like is a QAnon supporter and just won the primary for her state. And like, okay, so just because it's easier for everyone to have access to funding uh, and access to um, advertising does not mean that the right candidates get put out in front of the public and you are going to have people that are complete for lack of a better word wing nuts at best and like and you know something else at worst um but my point for that is like it is like a tight what's missing there is that there you're cutting out to a certain extent the political parties which served a gatekeeper function and which had access to all of this cash and could give it out and support candidates that they selected and so i think that that's kind of like all like everything we're talking about is a different version whether it's press whether it's whether it's political parties whether it's whatever there's like a different version of like we're we've lost a gatekeeper function at the at the fire hose at the like at the you know we like here's the fire hose but get rid of your gatekeepers and like that's kind of um i think that that's just kind of an interesting way to frame the problem because it's just very easy to forget every time you start talking, just like anecdotally talking about all the positives of the internet right now, you forget that all of those positives can have, have like corollaries in the negative. Okay, that was, uh, I think a very profound point around gatekeepers, um, right? And it's interesting again, that the structure, um, the sort of political structure of different countries leads to different results. The United States is one where running for office is very entrepreneurial, where parties are weak um, and, you know, primaries are quite open, whereas in many other, you know, in a, uh, for example, in a list PR system, parties completely control candidate selection and, you know, all of the things that you see, uh, they're strong gatekeepers as to who can uh, present themselves in an election and that that kind of moderates some of the impacts of technology. I want to pick up uh, on another one of your points, Kate, before going to uh, uh, Richard's question, which is, I think it's an important point about equality of arms, right? And one of the things that we experienced is that when Facebook would change a policy, well-intentioned, uh, in the middle of the political season, there are unintended consequences. So for example, they introduced verification for political candidates in March of 2018, 
um, which is a very good thing. We did it, but while you know that was happening for 14 days, we couldn't advertise on Facebook. And that was precisely the time that a local misinformation actor decided to strike and uh, you know, engage in uh, several thousand dollars of advertising against my wife while we couldn't respond, right? So uh, there's a lot of really sticky problems. Uh, that's a small issue, right? Just around the rollout of a particular policy. Uh, and you magnify that with the global scale of a platform like Facebook and there's this unintended consequences everywhere. But to go back to the news desert, question that Richard raised. Um, this is a very active uh, area of public policy debate in a number of countries. Um, Australia has a legislative proposal, uh, you know, a Google News task, uh, 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 tax, if you will. There's discussion of that in Canada where uh, some kind of uh, system by which social media companies, companies that distribute the content produced by others who are seen as news generating organizations have to pay in some respect. Uh, and this is a, a fraught political battle in a number of countries. Uh, I don't know uh, if the question is to subsidize conventional media per se. Uh, I think there's a lot of different interesting proposals. One of the more interesting developments in the United States, I think, is foundation funded uh, journalism. So the rise of ProPublica, of organizations like CalMatters, uh, not for profit journalistic enterprises that espouse the ethos that Jack meant, uh, uh, mentioned of 20th century journalism in the public spirit with a strong code of conduct. So I think there's lots of alternative pathways, but we do need to find ways to produce high quality factual information about politics and to have that uh, dominate the conversations that we're going to have online about politics. If democratic self-government governance is going to be possible. I think without that kind of high quality information being generated and the priority being given to it, uh, that kind of high quality speech, I think it's very hard to uh, crowd out the, the bad information, the misinformation and disinformation that is uh, flooding the public sphere right now. Well, thank you all. Uh, we'll go to the floor for questions and comments. I invite anyone who'd like to make a comment, ask a question to please uh, let me know. So let's now go to Kenya, in fact, to Abdul Malik Adan. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for organizing this. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm a huge fan of everyone's work here, um, follow it avidly. Um, so my quick question is um, in relation to holding big tech accountable to smaller democracies, that don't have the same regulatory power as the US and the EU. Um, we've seen, for example, misinformation and um, micro-targeting, all that has been problematic in Africa, for example, here in Kenya. And um, at the same time, it provides a lot of benefits in terms of political organizing. Uh, but but um, these issues have led a lot of governments to aim for a bit more paternalistic attitudes in regulation. And we've seen legislation that target users in particular for sharing misinformation and all that. So, and, and that really, I mean, the outcome isn't so good. Um, so my, my question is just generally, is there a different way that these governments could approach holding these companies accountable, um, especially seeing as they, they don't necessarily have the bulk of their users here and maybe sometimes could be an afterthought. Panel. Uh, well, the only thing I'll say is that it doesn't seem to me that if a company is worried about making a, a digital social media company responsible, it should aim at end users. That seems to be just, uh, that seems to be a distraction from the question. Um, the, the question you raise, which is how uh, countries around the world that aren't the European Union and aren't the United States uh, can uh, exert pressure on social media companies is a great question. It seems to me there are, well, there are three things to say about it. First of all, sometimes the kind of pressure they want to put on social media companies is not in fact pressure uh, designed to promote democracy, but rather to get them uh, to silence critics of the regime. Um, secondly, it's possible that some of the kinds of reforms that can be uh, uh, pushed for by the European Union and the United States uh, can have uh, overhang, regulatory overhang 
around the world, especially since in the case of Facebook, as, as Kate pointed out, Facebook would rather not have multiple uh, rule sets for every country in the world. They'd ra rel uh, rather have a relatively small number of rule sets. Uh, and so that if the United States and, and Europe can basically use their power to, buy, uh, to create a certain kind of set of rules that might have positive externalities for the rest of the world. But the third idea, which I don't know, in fact, if it has been adopted, is the idea of regional coalitions of governments, of democracies, of stable democracies, uh, attempting to use their combined exertions, um, uh, since the larger the populations they have, um, the more power they'll have um, uh, to basically come up with ways of together approaching social media companies and getting them uh, to, to move. Uh, India, for example, if it wanted to, I mean, I think under the Modi regime, this is a this is a complicated question, but if India wanted to use its size and population uh, uh, to influence companies, it, it easily could. And it could uh, work together with other partners in Southeast Asia to come up with a common set of, of uh, goals they wanted to seek. The problem we have is that the current regime in India is not completely devoted uh, uh, to democratic discourse. I just want to add, because I think it actually relates to um, Richard's question to me um, about the growth of global norms. Um, and um, I think that I think that most people would say that norms are defined by a community. And you if you do not have like what, you know, if you do not have an actual like, e like monolithic community or semi monolithic or something that can have communication around what the norms are going to be and enforcement of those norms you kind and like if, if you have something as large as the globe like the entire world there isn't really kind of um, a set of norms that can develop I guess the best you could kind of say is that there's some type of like natural law or something like that but there's I will say that I I don't when I said that before, like not having one set of norms it's kind of it's related to what Jack just kind of said and what um and what was being asked which is like you know i think this is a little bit what david post wrote about like way back um which is like these ideas of rule sets kind of getting fleshed out i think that basically what you'll have is coalitions of it'll be a combination of like david post and like jack goldsmith and tim Wu's book <laughs> where you basically have uh, you have pockets that are similar culturally, and so you're not going to select into something based on a geographic identity. Uh, you're going to select into something maybe based on a cultural identity. So I think that if you like, and so what I mean by that is like, it won't matter if you're in India, if you identify as like American, you're going to select into some type of American rules that they'll probably be strata, like that'll be stratified within that. And like similar for like the EU. And if you're like you're in France, you might feel one way. And if you're in Norway, you might feel slightly differently and there'll be changes. But like they're not going to, I don't think they're going to be confined to a nation state type of to a nation state boundary. I think that increasingly as time marches on and like we the pandemic has been, I think, accelerated this. I think that geographic boundaries are really going to become, especially for speech, going to become less and less important. Uh, and um, yeah, so I'm actually curious if Vivek and Jack, that if this invite, if this, and like everyone, like, and Richard even, like, like if people agree with that idea, that's like my big type of thing is like in the future, we will not really understand like that their internet is going to kill geographic boundaries slowly over time. Um, but. I mean, I think that's already happening, right? In the sense that look at this panel uh, and uh, our audience from truly around the world, right? Uh, which is incredible. And I think you're right, COVID has accelerated that. But at the same time, you know, the organization of democracy is around national borders and territorial nation states that have different rules around political communication, right? So that's where I think there's a real tension between wanting to encourage a robust global conversation on something like Facebook with a single rule set so we can all communicate and all connect vis-a-vis uh, -vis the fact that, you know, the rules on political spending and political communication here in Canada are much more restrictive than the United States, right? And if you have a common global platform with common global services being the place where that regulated political communication occurs, 
that's a problem. Even if we're sort of in the family of democracies, we share strong normative commitments to free expression, you name it, right? These are countries that are relatively similar and even there, the transnational nature of the platforms is challenging uh, to say the least. I uh, welcome people to make comments, ask questions. Uh, I want to recognize two of my faculty colleagues who are here with us, Professor Wendy Wagner and Professor Hugh Brady, two of my colleagues here at the University of Texas at Austin. Let me put a question on the table uh, until we get one from the audience. So we're in the midst of an election here in the United States. What are the biggest risks when it comes to digital democracy? Jack, Kate, Vivek, any or all? I think the biggest uh, risk is uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> well, I don't mean to laugh, but I wasn't Jack, expecting you, that answer. Jack, you, Jack, you took the easy answer, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> now what are the rest of us have to say something smart? <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, I think that, I, I think that, um, propaganda and disinformation on the social media platforms um, running up to the election and following it. Um, I actually think that the after is going to be a bigger deal than we think. I think that the ability to control the spin on election results is going to be um, really, really, really important. Right now, Facebook has said that they're going to stop running political ads like seven days, I think, before the election because there won't be time for like the cycle to respond to them. That doesn't stop them from appearing organically in your feed um, or memes from being exploited or any other type of thing like that. But that's one type of problem. That is something I think we've spent a fair amount of time, people have spent a fair amount of time thinking about is like how that will play out. I really think we have underestimated what people are expecting in terms of results and the time, what the time between the end of the voting on 9 p.m. in California and like how we're used to hearing like the results get broadcast and what's actually gonna happen because of the massive amount of absentee voting. Uh, I, just, I just think that, that that time period is gonna end up being exploited in some way by bad actors. And I think that that's really dangerous. Mm. I uh, share Kate's pessimism. I'd, I'd go even further um, in saying that, uh, I mean, unless there's a, a landslide one way or the other, uh, I think we're in for a really difficult uh, period. I would also say that I think the advertising, the political advertising ban by Facebook is a positive step, but truly a half measure or a quarter measure. Given what we saw happening in 2016, the really responsible thing for a company like Facebook to do would be to extend the ban uh, and to frankly ban everything. They've proven pretty incapable of detecting what's political and what's not. That's been my personal experience and my scholarly experience, you know. Uh, so given the risk, uh, I think, and again, you know, I'm someone who has uh, placed a Facebook, a political Facebook ad uh, for my wife. Uh, so I don't say this lightly, but I do think that we need stronger medicine uh, uh, because of the risks. Uh, which are enormous. And we're not going to know what, what will have happened until years afterwards. When so, you say ban everything, do you mean like all posting? Oh, no, like no, seven? no, I mean, I mean all No, because I'd like, all... I, I'm pro that. I think, I, mean, that, like, I don't know, know how I, they're going to... I will admit that I've had a fantasy of uh, what would happen if a virus disabled Facebook servers <laughs> two weeks before the election, just sort of gaming that out in my head. But I think, I, I mean, organic reach is one thing. Right, but I think the ability to uh, pay to reach people and to boost your reach is such an insidious feature in so many ways that if there were ever time for a moratorium, this would be the one. So there's a debate on Thursday, on Tuesday, the first presidential debate on Tuesday. Uh, some of us, all of us perhaps have seen examples of online ads where there's a manipulation of the words of candidates, not just at the federal national election level, but gubernatorial and all the way on down. What are the kinds of risks that this first debate presents 
uh, and how can it be policed, if at all? Jack's going to say Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one, one, uh, let's uh, uh, have some positive ideas on the table. I think one of the ideas that is interesting that's out there of uh, dealing with the fire hose, to use Kate's lovely and evocative analogy, right, is the idea of the circuit breaker. Uh, which would apply both to uh, a promoted and organic content. Organic content being something that you would see uh, by the result of being, for example, a friend or a follower of someone on a platform, as opposed to something that's been promoted to you. Uh, the idea here is that if certain content is uh, on an upward tra trajectory towards virality, and it may be suspect, well, we hit the brakes and uh, uh, prophylactically review it before allowing it to continue on its upward journey. I mean, that's something else that could be done uh, in the weeks ahead of the election to, again, slow down uh, uh, the speed at which this stuff is moving, right? Because we do know uh, uh, from a lot of different kinds of research that you can't unsee something, right? That the interventions that are aimed at labeling something as false, showing you that you've been uh, 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 you know, the victim of some kind of misinformation don't really work, right? So slowing down that initial distribution is possible remedy. Vivek, let me ask you a Canada-specific question. I guess it's a question that also applies to big countries that span multiple time zones. I remember growing up, there was a law in place that uh, if your jurisdiction, province had already voted, um, that uh, your media broadcasters could not report on early results to protect the vote in later voting jurisdictions. Is such a rule still in place in Canada? If yes, how is it policed given the digital age in which we live? Oh, I, I love this um, because our Supreme Court upheld this rule in 2007. And I think I understand the rationale for it, right? Is that you want people to, uh, be able to vote free of the perceived influence of the results somewhere else or the election being predetermined because of the population distribution in this country. Once Ontario and Quebec vote, uh, the election is basically decided. Uh, the rule's proven unenforceable uh, because of technology, right? And the fact that, uh, you, uh, I mean, leaving aside enforcement in Canada, there's the whole internet that could talk about a Canadian election and easily convey the results. So what's happened practically is that um, voting times have been adjusted across the country, such that people in the east coast of the country tend to vote later in the day. Polls are open in Newfoundland from, say, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. local. And they open early in the day uh, as you go further west, say, you know, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. local in a place like British Columbia, such that the results, as a matter of fact, come out at the same time uh, to obviate this problem. But, you know, again, the regulation is frankly impossible to enforce at this point. Um, I just wanted to add something in the, about the American context, Richard. So we should distinguish between uh, disinformation and malinformation uh, before the election mm. and disinformation and malinformation after the election. Mm. Before the election, one of the ironies of, the, of our terribly polarized society is that there seems to be no piece of information that can move very many voters this year. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, the president's support was about 42% before it was discovered that he had uh, tried to coerce Ukraine to swing the election his way. It was 42% after it was discovered, that after he was impeached, it was 42% after it was discovered that he called service, uh, service uh, men and women losers. It was 42% after every single scandal came out. And it remains 42% today, even after he has essentially threatened to become a dictator and destroy America's 230-year uh, experiment with democracy. That's because of, of polarization. Uh, so, Rumors will fly. It's true. It would be in a very, very close election, a very, very close state. 
they might make a difference. Uh, but um, it looks like the big problem that we're facing in the United States is a little different. It's that uh, when uh, the votes are being counted in the, the week or so after the election, the votes are being counted, there will be enormous incentives to try to uh, spread rumors that uh, ballots are being destroyed or that ballots are being counted twice or that uh, people are trying to steal the election. And that will be problematic in terms of whether or not violence breaks out mm. and whether or not um, uh, there are you know, attempts to basically you know, uh, to, to harm people. It won't have such a big effect on the elites who actually count the ballots and the elites in Washington, DC, that process will occur, but there may be an enormous amount of unrest. It's also the case that there may be an attempt to try to sway public opinion against further counting of ballots. This was what, uh, I don't know if you remember the 2000 Brooks Brothers riot, um, yeah. uh, in which basically they, uh, a bunch of, of folks who were Republican operatives basically tried to storm into an area where ballots were being counted to try to get that particular county from stop counting the ballots and in fact they succeeded. I mean the Brooks Brother, Brothers right actually succeeded in in screwing up the counting of ballots in Florida in that particular location. Uh, so you could imagine lots of people trying to get uh, public unrest um, directed against voting officials uh, to put pressure on them uh, to stop counting ballots. Uh, so in that case uh, there's lots of problems but again I want to say that in the United States again the American context the context I know best the major source of this disinformation, the major spur toward any of this bad behavior is going to be the president of the United States himself, who has been a much more powerful actor uh, in spreading malinformation, disinformation, not only about the election, but also about COVID-19 than almost any other source, whether in the United States or outside the United States. He is the target actor for causing most of these problems. Um, and so it's not clear. Uh, there's one thing that Facebook could do and Twitter could do is that they could go straight to the source and they could start changing the rules that they apply with respect to public figures. This is something that Kate has written about a great deal. And I'd love to hear what she has to say. But that's one thing they might be forced into doing if, in fact, he is the source of many of the problems. So what you're what Jack is kind of alluding to is something that I actually have written a lot about, but I think is a t is a terrible solution, uh, in the sense that um, well I uh, we've been mixing all of our metaphors here, so I will add another, which is the slippery slope of deplatforming, um, <laughs> which is kind of this idea that you start to do these types of things and you take away um, people's things. There are so many questions. It's funny. There's a debate happening right now um, about this uh, and cyber profs that is just kind of a, the conversation that is about like, well, maybe they should start, um, you know, it's similar to kind of what happened specifically with Charlottesville and Cloudflare, which is, I don't know if anyone remembers this kind of story, but at, during the Char uh, Charlottesville um, riots and protests, there was, um, which obviously um, ended tragically, uh, there was a huge call to take down the Daily Stormer. And a number and a lot of sites had employee walkouts or had popular pressure put on them um, to D like DNS servers, I'm sorry, not sites, to remove the Daily Stormers hosting and like domain name hosting. And um, it, so basically like what, how that works is there's tons of those, like there's tons of people that will register and host your domain name. And, uh, but like everyone slowly, like the major ones were taking it down and it was hopping from site to site would go up and come down and go up and come down. And eventually kind of ended up uh, that had been widely banned and it was also getting hit with what we called denial of distributed um, service attacks, which was like people were just flooding it with like spam bot hits and it would just crash like the thing. And the way to get around that is for small sites, massive sites like or sites that have a lot of uh, that depend on web traffic for their for for monetization have um, have certain types of like certain ways of basically distributing their servers so that they are immune to DDoS attacks, um, which can take down their server for days or time. Um, but for small sites that don't have that, there's Cloudflare, which is a one company basically that like gives more or less free 
um, you know, free protection to some of the worst players on the internet, uh, honestly, um, and a lot, keeps them from being, um, keeps them from uh, having to come down. And Claude Flair had long taken the business model of her. They do business in China, which means that they have to play by all of China's rules, right? So like that, you know, that kind of takes the business model of like, don't ask, don't tell, we'll do whatever like a government tells us, but we're not, but we're not going to like, we ourselves are not going to be in the job of like policing, um, policing clients. And they had had lots of terrible clients over the years, distributors of child pornography, all kinds like terrorist activity, and they would refuse to do anything about it. Um, and they got hit with this when Daily Stormer took refuge with their service there was this moment of like, well, Cloudflare really has to answer for this. So Matthew Prince kind of wrote this, uh, this very now kind of very storied blog post. He is the CEO of Cloudflare saying like, we shouldn't be like, I shouldn't have this circuit breaker on the internet. I shouldn't have this ability to just turn on or off anyone's speech at a given time. And he, but he did, he deplatformed them and Cloudflare went down. Um, I think a few months late, a few years later, it happened again, but with 8chan following the El Paso shooting, um, which had fomated on 8chan. Um, and I, I just think that that part of the internet is just going to accelerate over the next few years. I just think that there is going to be this massive acceleration towards um, using deplatforming as a mechanism. And the more people get frustrated by not having any type of meaningful participation in creating the systems that are governing them in a private setting. I think that they will thrash and they will demand, they will walk out of their companies to demand policy changes from the companies that their governments can't give them and that the companies aren't doing voluntarily. I think that they will protest uh, and do boycotts of various companies because they want to try to, or like, and the, and the ads that, the, that are like fund these companies. So that's kind of, I think we're going to have that. I think it's just a matter of time. And I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what to do about it in terms of like how we've structured democracy and access to speech in the interim while we kind of sort it all out. Well, let us now go to Turkey for a question from Ezgi Fulia Akus, please. I think you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. And thank you all the professors for their presentations. Uh, first of all, let me say that the subject is very new for me, but I really enjoyed with your presentations. I really like the concept of uh, techno-libertarian, uh, which uh, Professor Kate Klonek used. Um, as I am a constitutional lawyer, I don't know, maybe just because of this reason, I want to ask this question, but the concept of techno libertarian is also very new for me, uh, like the subject. Is it possible or would it be use, useful to have a techno libertarian or techno liberal constitution to have, or not constitution, but laws? What do you think about it? Um, if yes, if your answer will be yes, what will be the differences from uh, other than freedom of expression, etc., you said about maybe institutions, but how and why? I don't know. Uh, I also ask this question because you said that public law can't or wouldn't be a pro problem solver uh, about this issue. Uh, it's awakened my curiosity. Could you please explain a bit more this sentence? Thank you. Um, and also sometimes, like the country is Turkey, um, nearly authoritarianism or what, what do you want to say? Uh, you know Erdogan, I'm sure, um, unfortunately. Um, sometimes for the name of democracy, um, uh, the term digital democracy or it, it will be misused or abused by authoritarian states, I mean. Um, uh, like our kind of countries like Turkey, it is a vulnerable field to be abused as it has done before 2018. Uh, maybe you know the government banned Wikipedia. Uh, what do you think about it? 
it is easily it can be easily abused and what should we do as public lawyers constitutional lawyers thank you, thank you for the question thank you so much uh please i think uh, uh kate will ask you professor klonik will ask you to go first yeah what a what a beautiful set of questions i think that i think that um, the techno libertarian concept is very old. I'm putting something into the chat that you might want to read. Um, it's uh, a very uh, famous um, deck. It's called, and, and Vivek referenced this earlier, it's um, a Declaration of the Independence um, of Cyberspace. And it's a, 19, it's a mid 90s um, kind of very grandiose, and I teach this in my internet law class, and a very grandiose kind of moment of what the wild, wild west that the internet was. And that what I mean by techno libertarian, I mean that there was a belief in the 90s and it continues. And it was one of the things that fueled kind of the, the, um, the growth of Silicon Valley, that like cyberspace and the internet was going to bring us a world in which we could be free of the the excesses of government, uh, like big G government, meaning like nation state governments, and that like those rules wouldn't control us and that we could self govern ourselves and that it would be this space for freedom and democracy. And as I think we all know, because it's not 1996 anymore, uh, that's not like exactly what happened, <laughs> to say the least. A lot of this power regimes, a lot of the, uh, the the states that oppressed people had moments where they their power was challenged, but then they resumed their oppression or found new ways to oppress people, as you referenced with the idea of like taking the idea of digital democracy and contorting it to mean the opposite of what it might be supposed to mean. And so I think that basically, um, to your point kind of around this, uh, it's Techno libertarianism is certainly not my phrase, but it is the phrase of kind of, I think right now there's a lot of pushback on that idea, at least in the United States. It's seen as a problem and the reason that we're in this situation globally um, that we are and, and on like rules around speech. But I will say that you bring up a, your last point, you bring up about taking down Wikipedia, you bring up a really important point that it's wonderful to be in this international audience right now because uh, you have like a depth of experience that is sometimes lost in the U.S., which is that you rem like you are firsthand know what it's like to actually be cut off from information or know or from the ability to speak um, by your government and by government regulation. And I do think that because the, America has such a strong cultural background of freedom of expression, um, and that it's that and that it's codified in our constitution um, and has been interpreted by our courts so broadly um, that people forget that governments can be very, or take for granted that governments won't step all over their rights for freedom of expression. But that is one of the beautiful things that techno libertarianism talks, speaks to is as Jack has brilliantly written about in free speech is a triangle. It has allowed individuals to basically route around the problem of state kind of censorship through internet platforms, but introduced a whole new realm of, of problems as well. But really wonderful set of questions. And I would start, I would start with some of the cyberspace independent stuff that I put in the chat if you wanted to read more. Thank you. Uh, Vivek, Jack, Jack, Vivek. So I, I think if you're interested in promoting uh, human rights in Turkey, you should uh, understand that the debates in the United States were very much uh, skewed toward particular problems in the United States. The problem in Turkey, it seems to me, and of course I'm not an expert in Turkey, I, I only read about it, is that you have a government that is trying to uh, stifle free expression, educational institutions, and institutions of knowledge and dissemination and distribution such as journalism. That is to say, it is a soft authoritarian regime that is moving toward a harder authoritarianism. Such regimes generally try to stifle political dissent. Uh, they aim at institutions of knowledge production um, and uh, dissemination, such as journalism, universities, and, and, uh, and essentially they try to gain control of media actors, either by purchasing them or giving them to cronies or uh, uh, basically threatening them. Uh, so that they can control the media ecology. Uh, in those situations, it's very important to have an outlet, a way to get around, to route around 
the control of these institutions by the state. So in that sense, and only in that sense, the idea of a, a, a techno-libertarianism is attractive. It's attractive because it offers you a way around the increasing control of these institutions by the state. The only problem is, is that the term techno-libertarianism in the United States has another meaning. It's not the meaning of simply routing around the existing uh, forms of government control of institutions in order to create a space for free discussion and free expression. Rather, in the United States, techno-libertarianism is tied to a neoliberal conception of the economy, of the digital economy, and which means that the state will allow uh, digital companies to grow as large as possible with minimal regulation, and it will allow them to, in, uh, to use a combination of intellectual property and contract and also uh, avoid antitrust scrutiny in order to construct essentially the surveillance state. That is a privately run surveillance state, the surveillance capitalism. This is what Zuboff talks about. That is also a product of techno-libertarianism. And you can see what the problem is going to be. Once these companies have erected this <coughs> powerful set of surveillance tools and collected data, then states like Turkey can then turn to them and say, well, tell us about all the people from Turkey who are using your services. We'd very much like to know what that data says. And we'd very much like to work with you. And by the way, if you want access to our markets, we'd very much like you to cooperate with us. So that is in fact the dialectic, if you will, of techno-libertarianism and the way that it can turn eventually to harm civil liberties. So I think that from the standpoint of Turkey, instead of focusing on any particular phrase or slogan, you should instead focus on the deeper problems, the problems that I'm sure you know about much better than I do. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Vivek. Uh, that was uh, incredibly thoughtful. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add to that uh, exposition by Jack is that precisely because of that problem, and this goes back to Abdul Malik's question about Kenya at the beginning, is that technological, technology companies have engaged in a lot of jurisdictional arbitrage, right? The ability to try to serve markets from jurisdictions that are favorable to them in terms of the regulatory environment. So the United States, the European Union, and when I was in private practice, this is what, something I did uh, from a human rights perspective, is to say, okay, you want to be in Southeast Asia because you need to be close to your customers for latency and other technical reasons, but you don't want to be in a place where the police can you know, arbitrarily ask for data. Where do you put your data center, right? This is a common kind of uh, question that comes up at tech companies. Um, but there's a problem of democracy there too, right? And I think that's true. I, I mean, in Turkey, it's an extremist, but in a country like uh, Canada, United States, or uh, you know, Germany, there's this big conversation that's been happening for years about lawful access to technology company data uh, when that data is held in a different jurisdiction and what are the rules. And that I think that is uh, one example among many of um, the kinds of complications that arise with transnational technology companies that are extremely powerful in mediating speech, holding data, and the fact that governance still happens based on national boundaries, right? And, you know, there are, uh, I think, attempts to try to harmonize that in various ways, come up with international standards, uh, treaties, and other forms of agreements to alleviate some of these problems, uh, but they're quite fraught. There's one other thing I wanted to do is to go back to the Cloudflare conversation that Kate had and just introduce for some of our audience members who are more from the constitutional side than the technology side, uh, a very important idea called, of the, what's called the technology stack or the protocol stack when we talk about the internet. And the idea is that the internet is made up of a bunch of layers, right? And at the top layer, we have what's called the, the content layer. So this is where Facebook, et cetera, uh, or any website that you visit or Zoom that we're using, you know, transmits its information. But below that, there's a layer cake of other kinds of things, technological protocols as to how information moves, the physical infrastructure, the wires, right? And the point about Kate and deplatforming, right? So it's not just a question of uh, 
do you kick someone off Facebook or give them Cloudflare services or not? This is sort of moving down the stack to use the parlance, right? As to uh, what kinds of uh, rules are, and requirements are we going to impose on the, the physical layers, right? The people who operate the cables, right? Because they are at a prime place um, to intercept communications, to surveil them, to shape them, right? And this is part of the, again, I don't want to bring too many things into here, uh, you know, the concern about Huawei uh, in the United States and many other countries is that uh, they're a company that has access to that whole stack. They control some of the, the important nodes where communications are routed, therefore they could see it all, right? And that, that creates possibilities for surveillance, but also for censorship, right? They can prioritize what comes in, what goes out. So uh, you have to also look down the stack beyond the platforms themselves to these physical layers, the protocols, right? What are the what's the technical design of the flow of information? Is it designed in a way that is going to protect privacy or not, right? So these are other kinds of questions that are increasingly salient as well. Thank you very much. Let us go now, uh, not too far from where you are, Vivek, to Canada for our next question, please. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm in Canada as well, and I have a question which um, might demonstrate my, my un-Americanness which has to do with the, the appropriateness of private companies doing these, some of these things at all, um, because they're fundamentally sort of public interests. Um, and when you look at some examples, um, I, don't, I don't know if the, the regulation of the companies um, goes far enough. So the two examples that I um, would like to make are um, a couple years ago in Canada, the privacy regulator did an investigation of um, Google about the right to be forgotten and said, you know, Google, you're breaking Canadian law. And Google's response was, well, we don't care because you don't have any enforcement power. So, you know, tough luck. Um, and the privacy regulator is trying to take um, Google to court, but this is a very long, arduous, and ultimately, I mean, so far ineffective process. Um, and a few, I think it was last year, um, in the context of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, the FTC fined um, Facebook hugely for uh, the privacy breach that they did. Um, and it, I mean, ultimately hasn't hurt Facebook all that much. Facebook's still up and running and, and doing okay financially. So when you sort of look at attempts that have been made to control the behavior of these big tech multinationals, they haven't proved particularly effective. And I guess ultimately, um, maybe this just isn't a role that we should be giving to private companies. Um, and, and this is something that we should somehow get uh, a public oriented, you know, um, the, the public sector to do. And I, I'd be curious about your thoughts on that. Please, panelists. Well, I can start just by pointing out that there are, I think, three different solutions to the problem you raise. Each of them has uh, advantages and disadvantages. The first solution is to turn these, nationalize the companies and make them arms of the state, uh, like the CBC. And so that's, uh, that's like the, the Raytheon model in uh, Great Britain and the CBC model. Uh, so basically what would happen is that Canada would basically provide its own social media to the citizens of Canada. Um, and, uh, and the idea is, so then public functions would be provided by a public entity, in this case, the state. They could also create a public corporation that was, not, uh, was independent. That's the CBC idea or the, or the BBC idea, but basically that's it, state takeover. Okay, well, state takeover is not a crazy idea since the state has provided access to telecommunications before uh, radio and television. That's the whole point of BBC and CBC. But um, <coughs> there are two problems with that. The first problem is uh, the problem that um, uh, they may not have the capacity to actually build something like that. Uh, uh, in other words, so basically, they may, it's an enormous amount of investment to basically do it. Um, it, you'd have to make sure there was interoperability with other countries or otherwise what you're creating essentially is a little cordoned off area just for Canada, but not the rest of the world. And then the third problem um, 
Uh, the third problem is essentially that uh, uh, you have to be very, very sure that your government is reliable and committed to democracy. And the reason why is instead of uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg practicing surveillance capitalism, uh, the government of Canada will be practicing surveillance capitalism. That is to say, mm. it will be collecting data on all of its citizens and it will be creating digital dossiers of all of them. Now, it, Canada is one of the few countries in the in the world I would actually be closer to trusting, if only because of my... Yeah, but what if it was Turkey, Jack? Well, I was going to get there. Uh, but on the other no, hand, no imagine offense. Turkey. You imagine, would be fine, I'm sure. But yeah, like, imagine never. Turkey doing it. <laughs> Uh, and, and in fact, now that I think about it, I'm not so sure about Canada either. I mean, that all depends on, on you know, who wins the next election in Canada. So that's the first problem. You would have to find some way of preventing a state when it created these networks uh, from collecting any data at all about the people uh, as they pr uh, produce it. In other words, you have to figure out how you're going to pay for this and how you're going to commit it. And so that's very difficult. Okay, the second model uh, the second thing you might do, uh, since we're talking about public functions, is you might say it's really not, uh, is basically what I've been suggesting, which is that you basically uh, require companies to adopt public interest obligations. So they are nominally private, but they have a whole slew of public interest obligations that come uh, from operating in the jurisdiction. And the way you do that is you offer them some combination of carrots and sticks. And as you make a bargain with them, they'll get some regulatory relief. I say intermediate immunity in return for a whole slew of different public interest obligations. So they are now affected with a public interest. They're like, uh, um, uh, they're not exactly like public utilities because public utilities is a different model, but basically they're, regu they're in, uh, industries affected with the public interest that are supposed to serve the public interest and uh, their business model depends on it because of the bargain that you create with them. The third model is to say that, you know, you're never actually going to achieve true public interest completely with these companies, even if they're uh, highly regulated by the state, uh, for the reason that there's problems of regulatory capture, which come whenever you have significant amounts of uh, regulatory structure. Of course, things, again, everything may be different in Canada, because I hear that it's really a very nice place. Uh, <laughs> but in most other countries, there's probably going to be problems of regulatory capture. So that solution is to combine these forms of public interest obligation with um, reducing the size of the company so that there are many of these companies and they compete with each other uh, for end users so that none of them really get very big anymore so that they can't do enormous amounts of nuisance and, and pro create a lot of problems. And that requires the use of competition law and antitrust law to break them up. Break them up not only uh, uh, horizontally in terms of their size, but vertically in terms of their functions, All right? So I just wanna say that of the three solutions that I've just suggested to you, I think number one is a non-starter uh, except in Canada, which is a very nice country. But uh, numbers two and three are probably the best way of assuring that these companies basically promote the public interest, some combination of two and three. Thank you. Vivek, Kate, Kate, Vivek. Uh, I will quickly add, uh, first, full disclosure, I'm a litigant in the uh, Google, uh, in the Pipeta reference, uh, my clinic is. Uh, filing there. So with that caveat, um, I actually think the uh, Canadian experience has been pretty unhappy, both with government control of telecommunications, uh, so our telecoms monopolies that we used to have, and now with uh, problems of regulatory capture with our, our, our telecos, right? We have a very small number of, of providers here uh, who are deeply captured. But I want to pick up on Jack's second point of public interest regulation. I think this is actually a broader question around not just tech, but around the nature of capitalism right now. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman's famous New York Times Magazine article, arguing that the social responsibility of, of business is to maximize profits, right? Uh, which is kind of the high water mark of this idea of uh, you know, shareholder value maximization, and that's what the companies ought to do, that they don't have a social responsibility at all. Um, and I teach business and human rights, we could talk about that article. Uh, but what's interesting to me, as someone who's interested in, in a, a student of capitalism too, is that you know, the modern business corporation, if you remember about 150 years ago, you couldn't just incorporate, you had to go and get an act of your legislature to incorporate. And that the idea of business, right, those charters, had to 
name a specific public purpose. It's really interesting to look at the charters of old banks and railroads and things like this to see the role that the state played in supervising uh, business activity and how uh, those charters were only granted under certain terms because of the uh, a suspicion that these large combinations of capital uh, would harm a uh, number of social values, including democracy, right? So I really do agree with Jack that what we need to do is not nationalize, uh, but is to inject some of that spirit back into the companies, right? That they need to, that I think the rough edges have to be smoothed off of them so that they do align with the public interest. Uh, plus one to both uh, Vivek and Jack's comments, completely agree. Um, I think that basically um, I'll just, quickly drop the idea that like, I think that when we inject back into these companies, these like these different ways of incentivizing certain types of behaviors and carrots and sticks and values that we want them to have. I think that that is that is kind of part of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about getting instead of breaking up the companies or doing whatever else, being more thoughtful about getting them to have a participatory um, democracy process around a lot of their policies and a lot of their ideas. I will say for what it is worth that like I just a couple weeks ago I interviewed uh, Mark Zuckerberg about the Facebook oversight board that's launching in a couple of weeks um, and starting to hear cases and he specifically was like well we th I don't think that the best way to to maximize how we are setting these content content policies is profit for shareholders or like capitalism in general. And I want to try to, and he's talked about this a lot, so I'm not like breaking news here with this, but it was like interesting that this seems to be such a talking point, um, yet he's so vilified. It's just kind of an interesting kind of, but that he wants to separate to whatever extent it's possible, the policy on speech from the product building side of the company. And I think I would love to hear Jack's thoughts on that because I thought that that is, I think that that is what the human rights community, international human rights community has been calling for for a long time. Um, I don't know how you do that necessarily effectively, you do it over time, but I do think that this is like something that the companies are hearing and, you know, they're trying to, and they're really bad at it, put it into action slowly over time. Can I just follow up on that? There's, you know, I have this idea in my head that Facebook is like a, a, a fire company, a fire engine company, right? That puts out fires, but that are being started by the company. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's one division of Facebook. So perfect. Fires, then there's another with very, very nice people who have the, the engines and the fire helmets and they go out and they put out the fires. Uh, at, uh, so that's the company, right? And uh, the problem is that the, the, um, Many of the things that Facebook has tried to do in public relations, and also that Facebook is trying to do also with the uh, oversight board, are part of the fire engine company. They're the company that's trying to put out the fires. Uh, but it never, it, it, now I'm going to mix metaphors. Uh, what, what, uh, what Mark Zuckerberg will never let you do is access to the crown jewels. The crown jewels are the, basically the, the advertising uh, brokering system, which is the source of his wealth and power. Um, the Content Oversight Board, as it's currently constructed, it could change over time, uh, has no jurisdiction over the crown jewels. It has no jurisdiction over that, the part of Facebook that starts the fires. It has jurisdiction over the stuff that puts out the fires. And it takes only a relatively small number of cases in a year. It probably will take a very small number uh, from this, uh, in proportion to the number of decisions that its moderators make in a given year. So that in some sense, it's highly symbolic. It's important in the sense that it's highly symbolic, but it doesn't really get to the root of what the problem is. Uh, and that's why I, I tend to think that until um, uh, folks in the human rights area, uh, community, uh, start to focus on the business models, that uh, their uh, progress will be limited. And that that's really where uh, uh, reform has to come. Uh, that's why, and so that is to say, the idea of going after the business models is deeply tied uh, to Madeline's question about uh, making these companies serve the public interest, that they, they have incentives not to serve the public interest under the current construction of their business models. 
but you could imagine a kind of business that they were in which would make it easier for them and would uh, cause them to be more likely to serve the public interest. Yeah, I'll put this in chat. There is actually now uh, some critical mass of human rights research on this precise question around human rights alignment of business models in tech specifically, but more generally. So the UN High Commission for Human Rights has a B Tech working group that is doing work on this. Uh, uh, Amnesty has put out a report on this. Uh, so it's an active area of exploration uh, by human rights advocates. So I'll, I'll add some links uh, to some important reports that have just come out. Well, thanks to the three of you. Um, let's maybe close on a point of optimism if possible. How Jack, Kate, Vivek, what is the source of any optimism you, you may have uh, in the near term? I know Vivek completed his opening remarks on a high point of optimism. Let me invite the three of you to, to uh, help us make you maybe feel a bit better uh, after all of the bad that we've heard over the course of the past couple of hours. Uh, please. And Jack, please don't say Donald Trump. I have to tell you, if you want to feel better, you should go out for a beer. <laughs> you think I'm going to go out in the Austin streets? I can't. <laughs> yeah, that, this is certainly true. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to go to Canada. <laughs> we have great beer here. I'll just say that. So the point of optimism on which we're ending is beer, maybe Canadian beer. <laughs> well, free, free as in speech, not free as in beer, as we say in the technology community. Uh, I, I mean, I think, I think we're at the beginning of an evolution of these companies. We're not at the end. So uh, the hope will come from the fact that the way that these companies are currently constructed right now is not the end point. And so here, okay, I'll give you a little sermon designed to make you feel better. <laughs> I have been working on a book on digital speech essentially since 2004. Right, it's now 2020, and I have gone through many drafts of this book, and I've written an enormous number of articles, and right, then I haven't finished. And you know why I keep throwing, uh, uh, discarding these drafts, other than the fact that I'm I'm writing terrible stuff. The reason why I keep discarding drafts is that the structure of the digital public sphere keeps changing on me. So that the book I would have written in 2004 is different than the book I would have written in 2008, is different from the book I would have written in 2012, is different from the stuff I wrote in 2016, and is different from what's happening now. This is a, a, a digital public sphere that is not yet mature. Mature in the same way that, for example, the public sphere constituted by radio was mature by the 1940s, or the public sphere constituted by television was mature by the 1980s, or that the, uh, the, the public sphere constituted by cable was not mature until the 1990s. Uh, there has been such amazing growth and alteration in how money is made, and where these uh, technologies go and what they do, that uh, the issues keep changing underneath your feet. Now, if that's true, and if the giants of 2000 are not the same as the giants of 2008, and the giants of 2008 are not the same as the giants of 2020, that offers a slight glimmer of hope that in fact, as there's an evolution of this industry, through wise regulation, as well as just economic competition, that things might conduce to get better. That's not a guarantee, it's just a hope. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> Professor Klonick, Professor Krishna Murthy, either of you. I, I mean, I just, um, I, Jack always makes me feel better, even, even as he's like delivering terrible news somehow. <laughs> but, like, but I do think that we are in, I think that we are in like a, everything Jack said is completely correct. And I will just add that the technology is not just changing the world is not just changing, but we are reacting to it and our, the social norms that we expect from it, how we understand about it, the public and civic education around it is changing. Like when I started doing this, I started like my PhD dissertation with Jack five years ago. Jack remembers there was like, I had to start every conversation with like a one sentence spiel explaining that content moderation happened on Facebook, that Facebook took your content, people's content down and left up some other people's content. It was literally, and that it wasn't AI doing it, that it was humans. And that was literally just not knowledge. And now it's on the front page of like every newspaper and a made like they have beat reporters on it or 10 beat reporters on it for like the New York Times. And so like, I just think that we have to kind of like both like 
to use a use the condom and diversity phrase like a system one system two type of thing i think that these sites do encourage us to have outrage to be angry to react to click and share and do stuff but when you're trying to structure long-term governance and long-term methods for saving and helping democracy with these platforms we need to engage in system two thinking and be critical and thoughtful and do the hard work of figuring out what these technology technology platforms are doing and how best to regulate them and think the problem through and not just like like glom on to talking points or outrage or or hate at these platforms or the things that are on them um and i think that that generally also just like try to walk away from your computer every once in a while. It's <laughs> just like everyone needs to do that more. I'm going to go do that. I'm going to stack some wood after this. It's going to be great. <laughs> Very much looking forward to it. Yeah, second uh, getting away from your computer, I'll be tackled by my children uh, after this. Uh, but to pick up on a couple of points, um, you know, Jack's right that regulation takes time. You know, something I'm fond of mentioning is that, you know, automobiles were invented in the late 1880s. The first traffic lights appeared in the 1920s. It took us that long to regulate that technology in a very basic way. Hmm. So we're still in the early days of the internet of social media. This is going to take time. And there is, you hey, know- Wait, what, what were those years again? You blipped out for a second, but- uh, 1885 was when the first, you know, Carl Benz in invented the automobile. And it was in the 1920s that traffic lights were invented. I'm stealing that. And 1935, like, <laughs> the first parking meter. Right, so basic technologies of control around automobiles took that long to uh, develop. So it's going to take us some time, um, right? And I think there are some interesting regulatory innovations underway. There's a lot of activity to create new and better privacy law to enforce interoperability, et cetera. The other thing that gives me optimism, though, is what young people are doing, especially in terms of innovation. And there's been some interesting writing about how there's this new wave of, of 20 something entrepreneurs who just reject the entire ethos of Silicon Valley. Like we're building open tools, interoperable tools, and just sort of uh, the idea that you want to commercialize immediately is anathema. So I have some hope that disruptive technological change uh, might help us out of, the, uh, out of our current predicament as well. So that's my optimism, plus beer in my fridge. <laughs> well, thanks to the three of you for helping to end our session today with some optimism. And I want to thank all our registrants for joining this conversation. Uh, it's been a pleasure to host you. Uh, we wish you good health to all and, uh, and good luck as we approach the election in the U.S. Uh, and anything else happening in the world. Perhaps there's an election coming your way, Vivek, uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks, couple of months. <laughs> Thanks to all. Thank you, Professor Balkin. Thank you, Professor Klonick. Thank you, Professor Krishna Murthy. Thank you very, very much. Great seeing you all. Nice to be with you. Yes, thank you so much.